and we will be live on the radio in the San Francisco Bay Area, 860 AM on the dial. 30 seconds, and 30 seconds. We have about 30 seconds left. So here on the live stream, you'll be able to hear all the behind the scenes, all the cues to the show with our amazing producer, Colin. Um, we have quite a few guests, but bear with us because this is behind the scenes and we're going to get underway in just a moment. Colin, how you doing, man? Stream us 24-7 or watch us at snc.tv. San Francisco, 860 AM, The Answer. This is 860 AM, The Answer. Sponsored by The Way to My Heart Incorporated. <laughs> Welcome to the heart of innovation. 60 minutes that can save life and limb with new breakthrough ideas and innovation changing the healthcare landscape. Brought to you by patient advocacy group, thewaytomyheart.org, in partnership with Abbott. Here are your hosts for the Heart of Innovation, Emmy Award-winning journalist and founder of The Way to My Heart, Kim McNicholas, and interventional cardiologist and founder of the Save My Piggies Health Education Series, Dr. John Phillips. Pain sucks. And for individuals with blocked arteries in their legs, known as peripheral artery disease, it's a reality daily and with absolutely no relief in sight. They describe the pain as having a tourniquet wrapped tightly around their thigh and their calf, causing their muscles, their tissues, their nerves below to just scream for much needed oxygen and other nutrients. Timing is absolutely critical to diagnose and treat PAD, whether with medications, lifestyle modifications, interventional or surgical approaches, because once the tissue and the nerves are damaged due to a lack of blood flow, pain may be permanent, even, nice, even if blood flow is restored. There are limited choices to alleviate the discomfort caused by neuropathy and various chiropractic and wellness practices throughout the nation are taking advantage of these individuals by offering temporary solutions or what I consider just Band-Aid solutions that come with a hefty price tag. Insurance doesn't even cover most of them. But there might be a light at the end of the tunnel, I've learned this week from a practice known for pioneering some minimally invasive approaches to treating PAD, interventional radiologists, who are often underestimated for their skill set in treating this debilitating disorder well, they're thinking outside of the box yet again and finding new ways to help PAD patients get some much needed relief. So in today's show, we have Southern Vascular and Pain Management Center Interventional Radiologists, Dr. Stephen Lashak and Dr. Thomas Hotchkiss joining Emory University Vice Chair for Imaging Intervention and Division Director for Interventional Radiology, Dr. David Prologo in talking about innovative approaches to managing pain. But first, I think it's about time after my long monologue here to loop in my co-host, interventional okay. cardiologist, Dr. John Phillips, who's on call today, always working to restore flow in his patient's piggies um, to bring much needed pain relief, right? <laughs> ah, Kimberly, how are you? That was um, That was quite an intro. That might be the longest one you've ever done. I love it. I think so, but um, I think it was necessary, no, 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 right? No, definitely. I'm stoked for the show because I hurt my, well, this isn't for these guys. Maybe they can help me, but I actually pulled the muscle, I think, and I've got a lot of uh, cervical pain right now. So I'm I'm excited to hear what exactly they all do in the interventional radiology space to help folks with pain. I mean, for me, as an interventional cardiologist, somebody comes in with the STEMI, they're having chest pain, we open up the artery, they feel better. Folks that have rest pain... Uh, you know, from peripheral arterial disease, improving yeah. their blood flow often helps their pain. A lot of them have, at least in my assessment, uh, you know, longstanding neuropathic issues that, um, you know, are, I think, difficult to treat. And yeah. to what you alluded to, the the options are somewhat limited. And folks, you know, I'll have patients who will ask me for pain medicine because they're, they're, you know, they have significant ischemia or a gangrenous toe that, you know, the podiatry folks are waiting for it to demarcate. And I, you know, I just don't prescribe pain meds and they have well, a trouble. You can get in a lot of trouble nowadays as well. well for I mean, it's not even you're, trouble, everyone's right? under it's, it's so like, I, I, you're right. I mean, I think that it, it just becomes, it's one of these things that I don't see them frequently enough to feel comfortable 
prescribing the pain medications for. And I'm not saying that they need them or don't need them, but I think there are certain people that need medication or need treatment for their pain that aren't getting it. So I think this is going to be a great show. I'm a little bit outnumbered here. I've got three interventional radiologists versus one IC. So I'm going to do my best. I'm going to do my best. <laughs> so, that's, that's probably that's probably even odds, I think. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, we're excited to get underway, but you know, we got to kick things off with my favorite part of the show, moment of inspiration. Well, Dr. John Phillips, spectacular <laughs> vascular moment of inspiration. So Kim, you had told me that, and we can talk about this at some point too, but you said that you are now hosting a global show for AI, right? And Correct. I, I think I'm, I'm studying for my boards. Okay. And so one of the things we can do for boards it, we can do a, a yearly assessment of questions and and then we take a test towards the end. So I'm behind the eight ball here. I doubt my one of my buddies told me, who's also one of my partners, he said, you need to download chat GPT and you can ask it questions and it will kind of help you. And I've, 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 I've used chat GPT to answer some questions because I'm studying the valvular stuff, which it's been a while. So anyway, I'm like, you know what? Why not? I'm going to ch ask Chat GPT to find me an inspirational quote for today. So I just oh, said, I find so me an impressed. inspirational quote for today. So the first thing I got back was, believe you can, and you're halfway there. That's from Theodore Roosevelt. Okay. okay. So then I'm like, all right, find me an inspirational quote from, say, Gandhi. And this one was, be the change you wish to see in the world. So you know what? I guess I don't have to... You know, I, before I'm scouring the internet, looking for things, trying to find things. Now it's just chat GPT, you know. I'm, next time I'm going to ask for an inspirational co quote from you, Kim, and we'll see what chat GPT oh. can get me. We'll see. You know, actually, I would love to see if something actually comes up. That would be interesting because I've been <laughs> doing broadcasting since 1998. So you want, I'm going gonna, gonna to do it during the break and I'll see if I can find something. That would be so interesting. But um, be the change you want to see, I think is absolutely perfect for this because, you know, with, with all of you who are treating PAD every day, so many times peripheral artery disease doesn't present until a patient is truly ischemic when the pain is almost certainly permanent at that point. So no matter how much blood flow you restored to where, the damage is already done. And so we have interventional radiologists who are here that truly are the change that they want to see, that they know their pad patients um, have this pain. They can't always alleviate it. So they've been seeking some innovative approaches to relieving pain. Again, we have Dr. Prologa, we have Dr. Hotchkiss, and we have Dr. Lashak who are here. Hopefully we'll be able to tell who's who. Hello, gentlemen. Thank you so much for joining us. You can all chime in here. Hi, Kim. You're welcome. Welcome. Hi, Kim. Hey, Fantastic. Kim. Thanks for the invite. Thank you. And you know, I have to start with Dr. Lushak because he and I really kicked off this conversation. Um, he was working for another facility and he's been traveling across Mississippi and Tennessee, you know, trying to figure out his next step, where he wants to be, where he can have the most impact. And he has been meeting with Dr. Hotchkiss over the past year and bringing the two together. You know, Dr. Hotchkiss is much like you, um, you know, Dr. Phillips, where he literally goes the extra mile and unblocking arteries clear into the small vessels in the feet. And he was looking for a real partner in care, and he found Dr. Hodgkiss. And he'll tell me, maybe he can share a little bit why he he made that decision in the next minute before we go to break. Well, essentially, Kim, as you know, some some of my story, I was I I, I left a, uh, an organization and trying to find a place to do all my procedures, and it's kind of difficult to get a practice started in the OBL. There's a lot of uh, legal uh, issues and um, just technical issues just to try to get it going. And Dr. Hodgkiss has a, a very mature practice and predominantly focused, like I said, on pain. And um, so I'm, we were trying to get together for about uh, the past year. And finally, we, we did get together and really have the same kind of mindset. He's a very energetic guy, very enthusiastic, very patient-centered. He really cares about the patients. And I think with his pain practice and my uh, vascular practice, I think it's a great fit. I think we it, it, it there's there's a lot of similarities and there's a lot of ways we can you know treat these patients together so i just think with with tom was just a great fit because of the, his personality and his really commitment to patients and he brings another aspect to the table that i really can't um i can't perform so with the vascular re, with revascularization and then any residual pain or anything that can't be treated um, through vascular means can be treated through 
minimally invasive pain treatments. And we're going to hear about those minimally invasive pain tri treatments coming up right here on the Heart of Innovation. So stay with us. Leg health can indicate Everybody risk for heart time. attack, stroke, and amputation. Cool. If you have leg pain or okay, so we're ready to dive right in. Go. I I cannot wait to hear this. I cannot, Steve and and Tom. I'm I am over the moon to meet you both and hear about what you have done. We, uh, we, we work so hard on the on the SIR side, trying to say, look, we have like this thing that would be the holy grail, and it sounds like you've done it. And I am so honored to meet you and hear about what you've done. And, and I thank you for taking care of these patients. This is awesome. No, it'd be interesting to see what you're doing, David, as well, because it's it, there's so many different ideas. And, and the synergy, I kind of got a pain practice dropped in my lap and, you know, not, you know, I, I enjoy the, the stuff, but I kept looking at it going, it's killing me doing steroid shots, doing these blocks. Yeah. This last a few weeks. And, you know, then you go to stimulators. All right, everyone. One really minute helpful. Air, one minute to air. And so on. Um, so what do you think, John, that we jump in with? Um, yeah, why don't we why don't we take it back uh, with kind of Steve and Tom hearing? I'm curious how that integration works. Uh, and then we can can uh, pivot to David and get his thoughts. Yeah. And then they can go back and forth and share their Ping pong, and I'm just here to listen and learn. Okay. Do you want to, um, oh, to since you want you have exactly there. where you want to go, I'll let you take yep, it back. I'll, I'll take us back. Okay. Oh, I gotta, I gotta check my chat GPT to see if there's anything on Kim here. <laughs> You're hilarious. I'm gonna try something. Yeah, hold on. I'm gonna have to spell your name correctly because it probably will get confused. Oh yeah, it, it Ten does seconds that. Still there. RetirementWatch.com. That's your RetirementWatch.com. This is 8:60 a.m. The answer. Welcome back to the Heart of Innovation. For more on today's topic, go to theheartofinnovation.org. That's theheartofinnovation.org. Once again, here's Emmy Award-winning journalist Kim McNicholas and interventional cardiologist Dr. John Phillips. Welcome back, everybody, and thank you for joining us on this wonderful Saturday. I'm joined by three interventional radiologists and my partner in crime, Kimberly. And so, you know, before we went to break, we were just kind of scratching the surface between the relationship that Steve and Tom have, I guess, started to develop on the vascular side uh, and then treating folks that have what I think sounds like vascular pain issues. So, I'll I'll open the floor to you two. Tell me, like, how how is this synergy working? Um, I guess, you know, somebody's doing the revask, and then one, then you're kind of pivoting to check to see if the pain's improved, and if not, then how do we, how do you take that next step from an interventional radial or an interventional approach to kind of help them with with vascular pain, or I guess pain in general? It's it's an interesting synergy because I was taking right. my practice more towards vascular and doing more, doing more and more vascular. And then Steve and I started talking when he was wanting to leave his practice and I needed help. And uh, at that point I started watching, I've always said, you know, don't, don't go down the trification, don't go on the foot. I don't know why. And I go down and I start talking or I start talking to Steve and then I go see him do some cases. I'm like, this is incredible. Um, and then you see the patients in recovery and, and it's so interesting. They're like, pain's gone. My foot feels better, but it still burns. And, and being in the pain world for the past five years, immediately that just sets off all kinds of, why are we doing this? Why are we not doing a spinal cord stimulator? You would never in Boston getting that indication and, and even DRG where you block specific nerves out of the foot. And it's, it's amazing. I mean, I started doing the spinal cord stimulators and um, it, it's like magic. It, it truly is. You do a trial and the patients will come back after a week and say, I'm not letting you pull my leads out, the trial leads until you give me an implantation date. It's that effective. Wow. So, that's incredible. I guess to, to follow up with that, Steve. That, so like the, 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 the stimulator, explain that to our, um, the listeners how that works sure sure it's a, when, it, when, it, when i talk to the patients i'd say it's it's similar to a pacemaker for your back and and there's uh kind of an 
a wrong analogy, people will think it's a TENS unit. It's not. TENS units stimulate muscle. And so a traditional stimulator, you put leads in the posterior epidural space. That's the space where women get catheters for pregnancy. So we slide the leads in, in that space, two leads, left and right of the spinal cord, and up around the mid chest. These things pulse. And so there's eight electrodes on each lead and they can go right, left, up and down and capture where the pain signal is coming in. It's typically at the seven, eight interspace. So they will pulse with radio frequency waves and block pain signal from getting to the brain. Total different approach. It's like, let's quit trying to fix things down here and just knock down some of this signal. And have you had any situations yet between you and Dr. Lashak where you've come together and had this synergistic approach where he's performed a procedure and said, hey, you know what? This didn't solve this person's pain entirely. We might have gotten it, you know, to the point where the damage is already done. Send them to you. And then what do you do? It's, it's, it's funny. I, I mean, we, we just started working together and it's like it just seems like every single patient could go to trial. And, and it's it's a trial. If it doesn't work, the leads fall out and, and on you go. But probably success rate on a trial is 70, 80% go to implant. Steve, I'll interrupt you. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I, I'm sorry. I missed a part of your uh, your conversation. My my Zoom went off. But um, one of the things, uh, m- most of my, the, my practice is probably 90% below the knee, below the ankle. And what I've learned is these diabetics have a different, it's different than a smoker and a claudican. So these patients get... Um, predominantly, like I said, below the knee, they get below the ankle uh, disease. And it, the problem with the diabetics is they can't get flow to the forefoot. And so this is where the, the problem lies. So if you can't establish inline flow to the toes, they're going to develop a lot of these symptoms. They're going to develop uh, nocturnal cramps. They're going to get pain, particularly when they raise their feet in bed. They put their feet up. They get a lot of nocturnal uh, calf, toe cramps. They get this stiffness in their feet. Very difficult. And they also have neuropathy. Now, neuropathy is a tricky one because neuropathy – is a, is a microvascular process. We can fix some of the neuropathy with opening up those small vessels of the foot, the pedal loop, and so forth. It will help them. It predominantly helps their stiffness and their toe cramps. Um, and I find patients with really high A1Cs have the worst neuropathy. So we can open up their arteries, fix a lot of their uh, nocturnal symptoms, their, their severe cramping at night, uh, their toe pain, their, their stiffness. But some of them, we're, we're left with some with some neuropathic uh, symptoms, which are very difficult to treat, especially if they're not medically managed well. And I think that's where these stimulators, I think will be very helpful because this neuropathic pain is very uncomfortable for these patients. So I think we can only do so much endovascular with the neuropathic pain, because I think a lot of it is microvascular. We can help it, but we're not going to fix it completely in my experience. Yeah. And, and so David, you've been hearing this conversation you're doing, um, you know, Similar with you, you work a lot with Dr. Anthony De Palma over at Emory University, and you have a similar relationship as both Tom and Stephen Lashak. Uh, we do, uh, and but we're coming at this from a slightly different angle, uh, which is totally complementary to what you just heard. We are a large uh, tertiary academic center, and we do a lot of work on sort of the logistical side of these new procedures, making sure we get. Uh, approval from the FDA to place them and reimbursement and all these kinds of things so we can keep the lights on. But what's most fascinating about what I'm hearing is that uh, an interventional radiologist in general isn't, uh, we're not traditionally trained to manage these problems. We're traditionally trained to use these machines like CAT scanners or x-rays to do other things, manage trauma. Dr. De Palma does tons of trauma, saves lives every day. And what happened over the years, uh, interventional radiologists realized, hey, we can use these machines to guide needles everywhere in the body, wherever a pain generator might be. Maybe it's a tumor. Maybe it's a nerve that's been damaged by peripheral vascular disease. And we can do something to that pain generator to stop pain. So what you heard Dr. Hodges talk about was uh, that's image guiding placement of a lead to sort of decrease the pain signal from getting to the brain. But it doesn't stop there. We can take a needle anywhere in the body, uh, maybe our co-host's shoulder, uh, his suprascapular nerve, and we can we can stop the signal from 
from that pain generator, whether it's cancer related or vascular related or otherwise. And so it's opened up this huge myriad of potential procedures that we can do for patients. And to hear that it's being done like this in this kind of collaborative setting is uh, is just it's the future of of medicine that you that you have here on your panel. So now, let me there ask any concern, though. Um, just a quick question in, in, in regards to, okay, so pain is our body's signal that something is wrong. If you turn off that signal, could other damage be done because the body's no longer saying, Hey, hello. Right. So that's such a great question. And people ask that all the time. Uh, the answer is as follows. If it's the, if it's if the pain might be coming from something external, like a, like a tumor, Right. In which case you cut off that signal and it's okay because that's not really a protective mechanism that that pain generator, right? There's a second uh, uh, set of pain patients where the nerve itself is damaged. Uh, for example, uh, a lot of times young women who give birth will stretch a nerve in the pelvis during the during the birthing process. Now that nerve is damaged and it's just pathologic. It's just it's just firing pain signals that aren't serving any protective purpose at all. And in that case, we can freeze that nerve and have it degenerate, regenerate, and fix itself, right? So you're fixed, and now you're done. Uh, I know we have an amputee on the line. A lot of times, the same sort of thing can happen during the amputation, a damage to the nerve that causes false signals to be uh, sent to the brain about maybe a foot pain that's not there, or a real pain that's in the residual limb. Same thing. We can freeze that damaged nerve, damaged from the surgery or the trauma, have it degenerate and regenerate, and now it's fixed. And then the last set of folks are the ones that you're talking about who might have, say, arthritic knee pain. And if we freeze those nerves and cut off that signal, is the question becomes what you're asking, would that potentially make my arthritis worse? Although that's theoretically possible, we don't see it. What really happens is the person's able to move around more uh, and then potentially lose weight, decrease risk factors for other things, and become an operative candidate. So now they can get the operation they need. So just, I don't want to monopolize the whole conversation, but the short answer is uh, the potential theoretical risk that you might damage something by having temporary nerve signal interruption is very low to the huge potential upside. And coming up right here on the Heart of Innovation, we're going to find out just how long this sort of treatment lasts, but also we're going to get to um, what he was talking about with uh, Sally Hendricks is on the line, a diabetic amputee from South Africa. And I believe he has a quick short story to share and a question for the doctor. So stay with us. We'll be right back. Three years ago, my symptoms Everyone started. Everyone on that really... side is clear. So Sally. Yeah, <laughs> you're putting me on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> I told you one day you're going to regret getting to know me and being on our team. Um, but I figured, do you want to um jump in with um a, you know a quick you know question, share who you are and what pain you're dealing with, and see if they have you know ideas for you. Yeah. Um, okay. I'll probably relate it to the ghost pains that that I actually have continuously, you know, and um, it is an endless pain where. There is the feeling that you've got the leg, but the, the pain continues. The pain continues. I mean, how do you relieve that? I mean, oh, I, I, I have an sure. answer for that. I'll save it for the show. Okay. Yeah, that's great. And, um, you know, Dr. Lushak and Hodgkiss, you guys can literally chime in at any point. Just kind of raise your and just jump right in sure. um, and even ask. You guys can all ask each other questions and whatever. You don't have to wait for John and I. We, sh we should only be a minor part of the show. Uh, yeah, that's right. We're just here to, you know, stimulate the and, and guide the conversation. I love to it. Stimulate <laughs> the conversation. Are you, are you talking <laughs> to DRJ, David? still air. David, I don't want to steal your thunder. Are you going DRG for fan? No, no. We 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 published a, a study of percutaneous cryoneurolysis to manage phantom limb pain. And wow. we do five cases a month. Oh wow. I need, I need to see all this stuff. Those are good toys. Cool. You and I have to meet. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> this is crazy. This will be really oh, cool. fun. So Sally, are you ready? John, do you want to uh throw to, to Sally? Sure. You know, I'll yep. save my piece. Okay. Yep. Yep. Thank you, Sally. Am I pronouncing okay. your name right? No, correct. Sally. Sally Hendricks. Okay. 
Sally. I love hearing your voice. <laughs> Thank you, Kim. Oh, no, sorry. You meant Sally. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> how, much, how much time, Colin? We have one minute till air. Gotcha. And Sally is actually going to be our guest on the show in November 4th to kick off oh, Diabetes week. Awareness Month. Sweet. That's next he's week. Gonna, yeah, he's going to share. Oh, that'll be okay. So that'll be actually we can tease the next week's show. Um, that'll be our Save My Piggies special. Ah, very good. I love it. Uh -huh. Um. But he he's going to share it because he's really leading the charge in um, developing awareness in South Africa. So he's going to talk about what he does. What about our runner? Who's our South African runner? What's his name? I forget. Hemp. Oh, Mark. They actually met. I'll send you a picture. Oh, okay, cool. <clears throat> Here we go. 10 seconds to air. That's everyone at ParkSmart urging you to always drive safely. 8.60 a.m. The answer. Welcome back to the Heart of Innovation. For more on today's topic, go to theheartofinnovation.org. That's theheartofinnovation.org. Once again, here's Emmy Award-winning journalist, Kim McNicholas, and interventional cardiologist, Dr. John Phillips. Welcome back, everybody. We are live, and true to form, we have a caller from South Africa who is an amputee, and we're having a conversation about what sounds like minimally invasive techniques to treat pain for folks, right? I mean, we always worry about using narcotics and things of that nature. And so, Sally, can you hear me? I can All right, it. my friend, do you want to uh, pose your question to our, our colleagues? Yeah, um, me being a diabetic amputee and um, for the last three years, um, the pain or the ghost pain or phantom pain um, is actually excruciating and especially at night. And with all the therapy that I've gone through, painkillers, uh, you know, it, it continues. Mm -hmm. How can I actually cope with this type of pain? Um, it's there, but it's not there. Uh, if, if the panel doesn't mind, I'd love to, to uh, initially respond here. I, I, I uh, thank you for sharing and thank you for asking that question. Mm -hmm. uh, serendipitously, uh, this has been the focus of our work at Emory for the last 15 years. And uh, specifically, without getting too far into the technical weeds, uh, we've discovered that if we take a needle, I wish I would have brought one, it's just a small needle, uh, we can use CT guidance, which means we just put you in a CAT scanner and we can see the needle inside your body. So we don't have to open you up or do any surgery, right? And that we take that to the nerve that got cut during a surgery, right? So in order to do an amputation, uh, surgically, you've got to, at some point, damage that nerve by transecting it or cutting it. And in other cases, if we think of veterans who have had traumatic amputations, same thing. At some point, the nerve has to be cut in half in order for the amputation to occur. That causes damage to your nerve, okay? Um, that damaged nerve is sending signals to your brain about the foot that's not there. So it's real what you're feeling. It's real, and it can be measured. That That damaged nerve is kind of like freaking out now and sending these signals to your brain about a foot that's not there, right? So you feel pain. So with our guidance, with the image guidance, and, as, and this needle that causes uh, an ice ball, we can target that nerve just through a very small pinhole and uh, drop the temperature. And when we drop the temperature, something miraculous happens and it, this is i'm telling you about it now but it's you know 15 years worth of work to get to this point what happens is the temperature decrease causes that damaged nerve to degenerate so right there in that moment those signals about your false foot go away but what happens after that is even better the nerve will regrow but it doesn't it wasn't there for the surgery the regrown nerve so it's normal and it doesn't send those false signals to your brain 
And so you don't feel that crushing pain that people will describe. It's like having your ankle in a vice, the ankle that's not there in a vice. Um, and so we published a paper about this in 2014. Uh, and then since then have done hundreds and hundreds of cases. So it's very specific to the question that you're asking about how to manage phantom limb pain using interventional radiology. But it's important also because the principles of being able to target a pain generator like that with just a needle and a CAT scanner allow us to not just manage phantom limb pain like that, but millions of patients who have cancer-related pain or millions of patients who have arthritis-related pain. Uh, and it goes on and on. So thank you for asking that question. And I hope what I said made some kind of sense for the listeners. And coming up right here on the Heart of Innovation, we are going to now get Dr. Hotchkiss and Dr. Lashak's take. And also maybe check back in with Dr. with uh, Sally Hendricks to see if his question was answered and see if he has some hope again. So stay with us. Yes, you can have a heart attack, a stroke. I'm sorry, guys. Am I talking too much? I that just, was fine. No, that, that was, whole segment. Hey, that was, David, uh, are you doing transition. stuff in the arms? Are you doing that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, like brachioplexus stuff? Yeah. Huh. Yeah. I have a, I have fascinating story about uh, a guy that I'm taking care of now who's in a, a motorcycle accident. And uh, we're taking care of him. But but here's, here's an illustrative story of a motorcycle accident patient who damaged their perineal nerve. Constant pain, 10 years in the perineal distribution, right? Mm -hmm. um, we froze that nerve, uh, put her, paralyzed her foot, put her in a boot, waited six months for that nerve to regenerate. Pain is gone. That's I've like a thousand point. stories like that. It's, it's incredible. Wow. I, so, I kind of walked out. I, I did a lot of cancer care and we would do uh, microwave and, and radio frequency ablation heat. And, you know, yeah. I walked away from cryo because it takes too long. And I, ah. heat, you know, so, but no, that's, is so neat with that situation. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, that's no, no. That's interesting to me because the so, for example, uh, we we are starting to do um, radio frequency RFA to the renal nerves to reduce blood pressure in folks. Yeah. So heating up. So I guess my question, and then the other thing, the other question I was thinking when we do a venous ablation, you know, we have to be careful about hitting a um, a, a sense, you know, like a cutaneous nerve or something around like the sural nerve. So if you heat the nerve, does it not regrow? Or you heat, that, you heat that nerve, it's like dropping a bomb, right? Or or doing a surgery. It's creating mechanical damage that results in disorganized neuroma formation after that. The eloquence of the cryo is that everything it undergoes, I don't want to say, I, I think we, we have non-medical listeners, right? So that, I just yeah, want to, yeah, yeah, that's yeah, why yeah, I'm yeah, trying yeah, not to say yeah. these kinds of things that I'm about to yeah. tell you. What you induce is valerian degeneration, but all the connective tissue, epineurium, endoneurium, all stays intact. So you induce valerian degeneration, and then axons regrow along the connective tissue scaffold. A much more eloquent and predictable, eloquent and predictable process versus just heating it up, right? So, and by the way, the renal denervation thing is a real hot topic for us here at Emory because you're endovascular trying to trying to get across the vessel wall, right? We're going to just come percutaneous and get the aortic renal ganglion. So that way, everything that's coming in just gets frozen. Um, but if funny you would bring that up. No, because I, I started thinking about that, because there's also talk of having balloons that have little spikes on them that then, yes. you, can, you know, he, and my question, too, was like, well, I guess they can't get it from outside. So we got to go inside to get we it. We definitely can get it from outside. The reason why it well, hasn't been can't get it from outside. Uh, <laughs> but we can. It's so easy. But the reason is because people like Dr. De Palma are busy taking care of, you know, mass shooter victims and people who fall out of their treehouse and stuff. So it takes time to develop the, the literature to support the approach, but we definitely can do it. So I think what I'd like to hear from you guys so it can help our listeners. So, you know, throw out some numbers, like what percentage of patients have maybe phantom limb pain and what percentage are getting treated with cryo or just narcotics or not? And kind of give us, if you can, some numbers about who qualifies for these types of procedures and where to where do folks go to get help aside from asking their PCP for Oxycontin or something along those lines? I mean, I mean, the other option, I've had great success with DRG on Phantom. Yeah. Did you watch, David? Yeah. Uh, DRG? 
And I'm, I'm a DRG I mean, think, fan and yeah, a Spinal Cord Stimulator fan. Yeah, I mean, it's I think it's more of our like DRG. You, you need to get in the uh, the the orifice over there. And I mean, I love seeing IR because we can get there. Absolutely, and see the pain guys struggle, but um, I've do. had great success with that, uh, Sally. By the way, I think that's another interesting question too, because patients might be con- listeners might get confused about a pain doctor who you know, might be what anesthesia or, you know, we have family practice docs that go to pain medicine, I think. And as opposed to what, what you guys do. So that might, seconds, might be seconds. a little bit helpful to clarify that as well. Do you want yeah. to bring us back then, John? Yeah. Bring in. Yeah, sure. Let's do that. Let's talk a little bit about, we're having good conversation here. I love it. Yeah. Let's keep the conversation going in the next segment. Yeah, 10 I mean, seconds. Late last night at a recycling center. This is SRN News. 8.60 a.m. The answer. Welcome back to The Heart of Innovation. For more on today's topic, go to theheartofinnovation.org. That's theheartofinnovation.org. Once again, here's Emmy Award-winning journalist Kim McNicholas and interventional cardiologist Dr. John Phillips. All right, everybody, we're back and we're continuing a fantastic and uh, really stimulating conversation. No pun intended. No pun intended. No pun. Regarding, yeah, exactly. Uh, regarding pain treatment. Before we jump in, Kim, I just will say during break, I did chat GPT both of us, and you know we're not there yet, but we, we <laughs> might get there. It didn't recognize us, so we're not famous enough. That's okay. We'll have to work on that. <laughs> we're version five. Version five. Version five, right, exactly. So at any rate, we as we were talking, gentlemen, between break, can you all share? So I bet you we have some listeners out there who are thinking, okay, well, I saw a pain doctor. Why aren't they doing this for me? So huh? are all pain doctors alike? I know the answer is no. But just tell us, like, what bucket do you guys fit into and what bucket does, say, a pain management doctor fit into or I guess maybe an anesthesiologist who who does pain management or pain care? And does insurance cover it? Yeah. Tom. That's a good point. It's um interventional right? it, we're we're uniquely trained. So I spent two years doing a fellowship and to put needles and catheters in places in the body. We spend two years doing that. And if you know, I did probably two more years during my residency. And it's it's just so natural to take that to the pain world, whereas I, you know, I don't know much about a pain fellowship, but they're basically, I think they're taught to do epidurals and, and inject steroids in places. Um, catheters, not so much. They learn on the job. And then you find some guys that are incredible, that are that are very innovative and, and aggressive. And they want to do that stuff. So it's neat to see our guys doing that. But do, um, so if a patient is looking to have some of your types of treatments, they need to go to an interventional radiologist, not per se, not a pain specialist per se, right, David? So I, 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 it's, it's a good question. And uh, the answer really lies in uh, what it is that their underlying problem um, uh, is. So a lot of things can be managed, sort of a Venn diagram. There's this a little bit of overlap, right? There's a lot of things that the, that the quote unquote pain doctor can take care of. Uh, can take care of uh, doing epidurals for your back pain, for example, and and prescribing medications, for example. Uh, the interventional radiologist comes in when it's a sort of more advanced problem or more complicated problem that requires someone to put a needle uh, into the body with advanced guidance, right? But that doesn't help the patient who's listening, right? The patient doesn't know, do I have a problem that requires advanced guidance or not, right? And so the way that I personally solve that problem um, is to take it kind of a step further and uh, and and en- embrace this humanistic approach to patient care. And what that means is uh, I'll answer that question for you. So my my answer to the patients is, look, why don't you come to one of us and we will take care of you. So if it's us who who does the procedure, we'll take care of it for you. If it's somebody else who places a DRG, for example, or a spinal cord stimulator, or maybe you need revascularization, or maybe you need surgery, or maybe you need X, Y, or Z, 
I know all these options exist, not only because I'm a doctor, but because I've had my own family members go through these struggles. So because I know these things, I take on a responsibility to get you where you need to go. So if you are a patient and you're wondering, just come to me or come to one of the interventional radiologists and we'll get you where you need to be. Because at the end of the day, it's our responsibility to take care of you, uh, whether it's us who actually ends up doing the procedure in the end or somebody else. And so they can actually, because a lot of these patients, they need referrals. And how do they talk to the primary care physician about getting a referral to an interventional radiologist? And how do they know if that interventional radiologist ultimately is someone who is a, sorry about this, a hack or someone who really is an expert in doing this? Maybe there are some critical questions that they should ask. So it, uh, this is a good point. So the, the issue of the referral hasn't really, I, I wonder sometimes if that's somewhat of a historical issue. Uh, in my experience, if we talk to the public like we are now and they reach out directly to us by finding us on the, on the internet or going through the Emory website or so on, uh, that we haven't run into any issues uh, with regard to coverage because the patient didn't have a referral from another doctor. That, that doesn't you, happen very often. We, if, if somebody's not taking narcotics, if we're taking narcotics and we're going to give narcotics, we have to have a referral by the state of Tennessee. But otherwise, patient can just call and say they have a certain condition and we will see them. So, Tom, right. OK, interesting point there. So let me ask you guys this question. I've Do you um, kind of mi sprinkle in narcotics with what you're doing here? I mean, do you try to completely get the patient off the narcotic if they're on it? How does the narcotic or the medication work? Is it a synergistic kind of method or do you just say, you know what, I want you off if I can and let's do our procedure if possible? I let Dr. Hopkins go first. I don't want to monopolize the, the conversation. <laughs> yeah, my goal, you have taking care of cancer patients and they used to, the classic statement was, I still hurt, but I don't care when I take pain medicine. And some of the brutally honest pain patients will say the same thing. And, and so what I try to do, I'm not going to stop their narcotics. It's like, if it's helpful, we try to reduce it and get it to a reasonable amount, but to make it more effective, to last longer. Um, so, you know, it's the nice thing about working, I have a pain doctor that with me and, and they'll do the narcotic side of it, but gabapent, Lyrica, the, the, the medications like that. And so I'm understanding that you have a variety of different approaches for interventionally treating pain. Are they all durable or how long do they last before you have to, let's say, and can you do them again? And it's, does there come a point where you have done too many of them and no more can be done? It 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 drives me crazy. And I teach my nurse practitioners to... I almost think that sometimes in the pain world, they want to do a steroid shot. They'll, if it works for three months, they'll do that every three months for the rest of your life. And then I fix, uh, Steve knows how many kyphoplasties we do in a week from osteoporotic, you know, steroid induced, for, uh, uh, osteoporosis. But, um, you know, it's, it's, you will do the steroid shot short term, buy some time to think long term. And then you go to something like cryo where you're actually repairing a problem or DRG. I have patients 10 years out with what does DRG stand for again? Dorsal root ganglion stimulator. Gotcha. So you're targeting yeah, individual nerve. In, okay. Gotcha. So, so instead of, the general everything from your lower extremities you know if you have an amputation of the right foot and the pain phantom pain's there we can target the l5 s1 nerves and, what, and what shut about, down those what what about we've had a couple of folks on the uh, chat ask about pad so claudication pain okay so there are patients out there and i've got a guy that he's he's been on our show he's a save my piggies guest who He's not really revascularizable. I mean, we've done, I've done a ton of interventions to him. He's had bypasses, they fail. He has claudication pain. And he has it to the, like, he kind of knows how far he can walk and, uh, and gets it. And now it's becoming a little bit, it's creeping up on him. Can you treat claudication pain for these folks? David? Yeah, I, 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 I'll, uh, well, I'll answer Kim's question first, if you don't mind. I yes. would always respond uh, with regard to, is there a point that you've done too many, you can't do any more, can they be repeated, so on and so forth. Uh, I would go back again and respond to that question 
the way that I would answer any one of my family members, my daughter or my wife who came to me with a problem at any point along the spectrum, right? And I'll tell my patients, look, now that you're here, you're my patient and I'll take care of you. It's 2023. So there's something that can be done to improve your condition. And if you were my daughter or my wife uh, or my friend from this new radio show, I wouldn't tell you, hey, ah, you know, tough, tough, tough luck. We're out of options. Good luck and cut you loose to the world to figure it out yourself. I'll take care of you and figure out what's available for you in 2023. So there's no end point at which I'm going to throw up my hands and say you're on your own. So that would be my answer to that question. If it's not me, I'll find you the right person. Um, uh, but beyond that, we we certainly can treat claudication. Dr. Hotkiss is treating claudication with those spinal cord stimulators successfully for sure. Uh, and also there's a procedure now that we can do with advanced imaging that was abandoned years ago because of safety issues. Years ago when they tried to inject the lumbar sympathetic plexus, it's called, uh, they would run into some complications because there's other structures around there and they might hit them accidentally with the needle. But now because we have this precise imaging guidance that I spoke about earlier, the CAT scan guidance, we can get into this thing called the lumbar sympathetic plexus, which essentially provides sensation and regulation to the, for pain to the whole leg. And we can either uh, inject it, we can ablate it, uh, and we can improve claudication with that single needle procedure, uh, amongst other things. And coming up right here on the Heart of Innovation, we'll continue the conversation and have our final takeaway. So stay with us. Everyone is clear on that Every side. 40 seconds. So insurance is not an issue for these folks, uh, like for spinal cord stimulators or DRG things? It, it, DRG is experimental a lot for some insurance companies. Okay. Um, but most of the time you fight the battle and you'll you'll win. And sometimes you have to pursue it a little bit. Um, but but spinal cord stimulator with their new indication for peripheral neuropathy. Sorry, yeah. won this not so much. 30 seconds till we air. Okay, how do we want to, you know, finish this? You got, what, four minutes? So just, four minutes. Real, I guess, final so, thoughts from everybody. Yeah. Each one of you gets one minute. Is Steve on? Yes, yep. yeah. I'm on. Good. Steve, I'm sure you have a couple things you want to get in there before we. Well, so, I mean, I, I think this is this is great that Tom's here and David's here. I mean, this here. Is... So we'll start seconds. with Steve. I'll start Do with you and then Tom. Five. And this is eight sixty a.m. The answer. Welcome back to the Heart of Innovation. For more on today's topic, go to theheartofinnovation.org. That's theheartofinnovation.org. Once again, here's Emmy Award-winning journalist Kim McNicholas and interventional cardiologist Dr. John Phillips. This show has just flown by. I wish we could spend another hour discussing it. Maybe, Kim, we would then be on ChatGPT, but that's neither <laughs> here nor there. So let's finish up. Uh, final thoughts from our guest, Steve. Um, what parting message do you want to share with our audience? Well, I think um, with with leg pain, I think it's it's, it's sure. complex, and some of it some of it can be neurogenic, some of it can be vascular. And I think um, it kind of overlaps. So I think when you have patients with consider claudication, pain with walking, um, I'm getting a little echo here, but pain with walking, um, it's claudication. It's, it's pain that if if you walk, and it's sort of like angina of the legs. You walk, you get pain. There's there's options there if it's uh, related to uh, vascular etiology, we can revascularize that with balloons and stents. Then you have rest pain, which is a little bit of a different animal, and that's uh, that also may require revascularization and or some type of pain control. And I think the uh, the combination of revascularization and having pain physicians to and interventional radiologists to manage that is 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 the way to go. And I think it really expands the opportunities for patients to get better care. Well, quick question as we go into, let's say, Tom, really quick. So let's say someone has, you know, um, their arteries blocked clear into the, their foot. They're really, it's so calcified, can't get much done there in terms of revascularization, putting in balloons, removing some of the plaque in there. And you really want them to get out there and walk and grow their natural bypass, these collateral vessels to reroute blood flow around those blockages. Is this potentially an answer to getting them to naturally be able to, um, get their collateral growth to restore the blood flow to keep them on their feet. It's, I mean, that's a, a, a great question. And if you can decrease the pain, they're going to improve their, their activity. And um, 
and and improve the blood flow and and do exactly what you were saying. And I think that's a, a an exciting approach. And and it's I hadn't thought about the sympathetics, and it's embarrassing I haven't. That's a, a great you hit both of them. You know, it's amazing what you could do. I would think. Final thoughts from you, and then we'll jump to David. No, it's it's exciting uh, collaboration. I was in the cancer world a long time, and we were, we came together with the oncologists, and that's what I'm seeing with Steve, and and you know you bring the pain world and the vascular world together, and it's like, you know, well that's the best it's going to be after you revascularize them. It's like no, there's there's a lot of stuff we can do, and it keeps improving. Exciting Thank stuff you. all the time. You're welcome, David. Final thoughts. Uh, I I would just echo that things continue to improve. There is always something that we can do. Uh, you can find us. You can you can find me uh, on the internet. I'll try to help you to get where you need to be. You can go to the Society of Interventional Radiology. Uh, they'll give you uh, interventional radiology pain focused physicians in your uh, location. But but we're here to help. Fantastic, and I'm curious. I'm going to let um, Dr. Phillips here take us out, John. Um, you've been outnumbered by the IRs, learning something new today. So I'm going to let you give the final takeaways and send us home. No, I just, I think it's the beauty of this show is you, you learn something. And I had no idea that you could do some of these things to help folks that have chronic pain. So I, I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with all of our guests, Kim, we've had a, an excellent show. Uh, and you know what, we're just going to continue the heart of innovation and saving the piggies. So with that, I hope everybody has a fantastic rest of their weekend. And thank you for joining us. Yes. And next week on the heart of innovation, actually our Save My Piggy special, um, Sally Hendricks, um, diabetic amputee, who's really been an advocate for others in South Africa. You heard him ask a question here today. He is now going to join us next week and share his full story. I'm really excited about that. So it's probably too late to try to do that on location in South Africa. You know, hey, you know, maybe <laughs> Sally's still here. Maybe he would fly us all out there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, great show. Thanks, Kim. <laughs> Thank you. Have a great weekend, everyone. See you guys. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. You guys are clear on that, so I'm just letting it play out for the uh, Okay. Um, so if, um, I don't know if... Um, to the heart. David and uh, Steve and Tom want to stick around for a little bit. We have our after show. It is co-hosted by, um, and I think I saw him there, legendary Harlem Globetrotter Larry Shorty Coleman and our PAD task force co-chair Douglas Salisbury. And so if you mind, you know, sticking around to answer a few patient questions, we have quite a few on the line we'd like to get to. I will, um, I see some nodding. That would be great. Um, and John, always love to have you, you know, staying yeah. around as long as you can. I'm just going to you know. check on an echo. So I'm going to mute myself, but I'll be back. Okay, great. Yeah, Douglas, I'm going to let you and uh, legendary Harlem Globetrotter, Larry Shorty Coleman, take it away. We're talking about um, pain management. And so um, you can start getting brain, to some other my questions. Brain, my brain's fried. That was, that show was just that. Now that was, that was utterly just that was fantastic to listen to the new technology out there today. I sponsored a young man in recovery a few years ago, and he lost his arm in a work accident. He had to go in every six months so they could do something to the nerves so he could operate and function as a human being because he couldn't because those nerves, like you were talking about, David, kept kept. And he had to go in every six months or so to get some procedure done so he could work in the technology. Where do you see it going from here? Yeah. Like with PAD and just specifically Claudia Asian, you know? I think the most amazing thing that has happened in the last 10 years has been uh, the establishment of the spinal cord stimulators um, that Dr. Hotchkiss was talking about to manage peripheral neuropathy because essentially claudication uh, has to be transmitted. You have to feel that pain somehow. Even though it's a vascular problem, your brain knows about it because nerves send signals to your brain. And so that technology can quiet those signals. And big trials have come out, especially in diabetics, showing that those quieted signals result in patients reporting less pain. So those spinal cord stimulators are, are going to be the forefront 
of therapy for claudication and lower extremity pain for the foreseeable future. So, and like Salad, Salad, where would so where he is, you could help him find somebody there who could do like that procedure or something. I like could that to help him. Wow, and I could. Like in, how many of y'all are out there, like in the rural, the rural communities across the country? Or do we, you know, you know, you have to go to Houston, Texas to find one or that or mm. Los just, Angeles. Just, sorry, real quick, guys. I got to run and take care of a patient issue. Pleasure. Let's I'd love to reconnect with everybody. Have a great uh, weekend and, and as such. OK, great Thanks. to meet you. So Thank much, you so John. much. Thank you. Thanks, John. Thank you. Take care. Take care, John. Hmm. Doug, it's, it's kind of interesting with me and Steve. We're in Memphis, but we go down into a lot of rural areas. And and we actually can do you know with a small lab we can do the treatments we're doing it's it's really it's amazing the number of patients that show up because we opened a a clinic just north of here and I thought what you know this will never fly and I cannot catch up to the number of patients we see there it's just unbelievable but I'm I'm so thankful we can take this treatment to those people there. <laughs> Yeah, I think that I think the patient has to be an advocate. I mean, for themselves, they really have to search this out. And obviously, with the technology, with the internet, it's a little more difficult for older patients to um, to navigate it. But I really think um, people are out there, and and they're out there in places you would not think they're out there. Everybody thinks you got to go to these big universities. No offense, David, but no, yeah, I think I think there's no. I think there, there are people are out there, but you have to. And, and obviously, Kim is an advocate for that, and she's really kind of uh, placed a lot of these patients, uh, put a lot of these patients in a situation where they get excellent care. So you really got to you got to research it, you got to search it out, and you can find people. Um, you may not have to go to the big cities all, all the time. So, yeah, and it's something that uh, David and I talked before the show, and he accepted um, that he is going to be our our chief pain management advisor, and he is going to help us locate a lot of these doctors around the world so that our Lifesaver hotline can end up helping to well, helping us to get the word out to all of our patients globally and that there are options available and who's doing it in their region. We can find them. We can, can I can find someone for Sully. And, uh, you know, I get calls from all over the world every week and we have the network through the Society of Interventional Radiology that allows us to find someone near you. Uh, you certainly, in 2023, don't have to travel to me, though. I'd love to have you. Yeah, and, uh, no, Marcia, definitely. Marcia and... has a question. Okay. Marcia, Marcia, you need to unmute. Unmute. Thank you. I actually have two questions real quick. Um, if we, as individual patients, were going to try to seek this kind of help, what would we be looking for? Because obviously every, you know, I have an interventional radiologist and he's never discussed these things. So who would I look um, for in this area? That's my first question. Right. So um, this is sort of my greatest professional frustration, the question that you're asking now. And, uh, and it's funny that they brought up chat GPT because I've thought a lot about how to solve this problem. How does uh, how does the average person find the right physician to take care of, of their problem? Um, and so that's, that's an open-ended problem that we're working on. But if you had to do it tomorrow, I would say uh, either come through me or go through the Society of Interventional Radiology because they, they'll give you like a keyword search on their website, which I can put on in here. Um, and if you put in the keyword just pain at that website, they're going to give you doctors <laughs> in your location. Um, yeah. but I'm forever, I'm forever meeting patients who I could have helped five years ago accidentally like this or at Publix or something like that. And so it's something we need to do a better, better job of, but for now, that's my best answer. Thank you. you know, one thing I want to say, what? David's a great, I, uh, David's a great resource. I can tell and he sounds, and he really sounds like he cares about people out there and, you know, a lot of, and if you can get a hold of a guy like that, he can, uh, he can direct you. The problem is there's not a lot of guys out there like David. So if you're fortunate enough to get someone like him, then you're, you're in good shape. So, but you have to, you have to, like I said, back to being, you have to be an advocate and you have to find the right people. 
Now I have one website I wanted to bring up and, and show you guys um, right now. This is what I think David was talking about. And you can right. go to SirWeb, S-I-R-Web.org, and you can click mm -hmm. on Find an IR, search for a doctor, and even, I guess you even have India in there, Area of Expertise. Worldwide, I, worldwide. I guess that you can go down. Oh, there it is. It's pain management. So oh, you can right. find an interventional radiologist that is um, in pain management. So I'm going to do Tennessee because I want to see. I probably will show Actually, up. Tom, I want to <laughs> see if you show up. <laughs> I do too. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to hit United States. So we're going to, we're going to see if we can find you, Tom, see if you're registered. What city are you in? You're in Memphis, right? There he yeah. is. He's right here. So nice. Tom yeah, is really actually good. listed. And I know Tom, um, which really good. There's only one of two actually across, um, actually you're both in the same area. Um, but you are going to have practices, um, in, in Mississippi, as well as are you, do you have one that you're going to be opening in Kentucky or just right there at the border? No, so our surgery center is going to be in Fulton, Kentucky, which is at the southern border of uh, of Kentucky, which is seven miles from our Union City office. And then we have we're in Blyville, Arkansas, so we're in western or eastern Arkansas and then northern Mississippi. <clears throat> OK, so I want to see if. um. Well, Mirsha's still there, David, but where are you? He's there, Johns Creek. Where are you? No, I'm listening under Johns Creek. Oh, there Creek you are. You're in Johns Creek. That's why. So you're, oh, wow. Okay. Um, Emory University. Of course, I was looking, I was just looking under Atlanta in particular. Mm -hmm. It's funny right. because it's good to know for Mirsha because Mirsha Christescu used uh -huh. to be at Emory and Atlanta. He was really our go-to. He was he was just an amazing miracle worker there. He's moved to Milwaukee, and now we have him saving life and limb. We're hoping we have a new one. We just gave him one of our friends in the group that is going to, he's going to take a stab at next week. But he's now in um, Milwaukee. But it's good to know there you are in Johns Creek. And so, mm -hmm. for example, I know we have Marie on the line. So I'm curious if we have any in Michigan that might be of interest for her so we can help well, please and tell have... me yes. <laughs> yes, this would be great. So okay. um where are you? Not near Ann Arbor. So Rochester, Midland, Jackson, Grand Rapids, where would you want to go, Marie? Rochester's the closest to me. Okay. So maybe we can have either David or um or Tom might be able to reach out to Peter Rudeski and see if sure. he could can um, they? Can you explain just exactly how to? Right. What What are they doing to make it where it's not going to be like this anymore? So, so when you say like this, are are you talking about pain in your feet, or what kind of pain do you have? Oh, it, it's my entire leg. It's my thigh, my calf, my foot. It's I've had so, a yeah. lot of issues. <laughs> She's had yeah. more than 65 procedures and the latest yeah. procedure she had to revascularize, she just keeps blocking right. up. She has, you know, some clotting issues going on. Um, the, you know, just that's keeps re-clotting. Um, but she had um, a, a modified aorto bypass um, uh -huh. on one side. Um, they keep trying to revascularize below her knee because in her calf, it just keeps blocking up, blocking up, blocking up, blocking up. Oh, Marie. And so. We're going to help you. So you, you're you in Michigan? Yeah. Oh. Is the University of Michigan far from you? Oh. You of them is the ones who wanted to cut my leg off. I won't go back there. What if I have a guy there, though? He's a new interventional radiologist, not to manage your vessels, but to manage your pain. And he yes. he he's going to be in a totally separate department, away from oh, the yeah. vascular people. Hey, His name is Shantanu. Up, he's Alan? living a oh, life no, no, no. Of, uh, of exactly this. And I promise you, he can help you. You can either do a lumbar sympathetic block. He could potentially do an implantable for you. But he is the is one of these new uh, interventional radiologists who's just exploding and helping people with pain. Not on the vascular side. He's just going to help you with pain. That would be, would be amazing. Willing, I'd be willing to talk to him. You'll yeah, love him. And if, if Kim can connect us afterwards, um, yes. then we'll bring Marie back some other day to tell the story of how well she did. Yeah, no, this is really exciting. There is some hope. Um, I'm I might cry because Marie and I have been working together, Marie, for how long? I will I cry don't... because I can't keep doing this, Kim. You know I'm at my breaking point. I can't do it no I more. Know. Oh, we can help you. We can help yes, you. Please. 
We just need to get her walking. If we can just, she's revast. We just, she has so much permanent damage that's in there because it's just the ischemic pain has just gone on. It's just been so long. And yes, she now has some blood flow. I think she's going to need one more procedure, but we just need to get her walking. We just need to get her building those collateral vessels and she can't. It, and, and permanent damage in there. They, Marie, said, you don't... they said I have killer collaterals in my leg. It just, it's not enough. He will go away. And right now you don't have any implantable device or anything so far to help you? What do you mean? So so you don't have a spinal cord stimulator or, or what Dr. Hotkiss was calling a DRG? You don't have those things? No. Is that that strip they want to put up your spine? And it's yeah. To, uh, oh, I I was advised not to do it. You don't want it, Marie. You know they talk about doing the surgical one, and and those are great if you get a good surgeon who lays it in perfectly and that kind of thing. But I if if it isn't right, it doesn't work. But you do yeah, if you do a, a traditional trial. It's have you had an epidural injection or some kind of nerve blocks? No. Um. I was advised not to have it done, and my brother did get it done. Um, we both inherited, you know, the bone deterioration in our spine from my father. And I refused to let him do surgery on my back, but my brother is on his 14th, and they put that in there, and they had to t pull him right in to take it out because it was just so unbearable for him. So the key here, sorry to interrupt you, Dr. Hoskins, but the key here, uh, if we, if you only, if all anyone hears is this next statement, it's this: what we're doing is not surgery. Okay, so go ahead, Dr. <laughs> and, and you know, it sounds like you know, and your brother, they if they get the leads, mm -hmm. don't talk to the expert. I'm not hearing him, Kim. Oh, did he just sorry. fall I'm off? Sorry. Yeah, I got me. Oh. I'm sorry. Uh, Marie, it's what what I'm hearing. If like in your brother, if they put the leads and they fell off to the sides, what we call the gutters, it's incredibly painful. And that's what's neat about interventional radiologists and the guy David's talking about, I bet can do this very well. They get them in the correct place. You don't even know they're there. It's just by the end of the procedure, your pain is melting away. And you do a trial. It's not like you by the farm with surgery where you do it and you're like, that didn't work. And I can't go back. If right. it's no good, the leads just no, no, literally no, no. fall out and no harm done. What is the um, success rate of this actually stopping the PAD pain? It's or do so, you even have numbers for it. The, the, no, the company tracks it both Nevro and, and Boston track my success rate. So, for every 10 trials I do, it's almost, you know, between eight and nine of those patients are successful. It's that high. Really? And they oh, fuss I, at me that I'm not yeah, doing I enough. Would definitely, I would definitely talk to them then. Do I think if you reach out to get, he'll get you connected with this guy. I'm sure he's so well trained and, and he'll. Well, can you time. travel to Dr. Hotskis? Are, are you able to travel? Who? Me? Yes. You want to drive uh, on over to Tennessee? Yeah. <laughs> I drive there. It would stop the pain, Kim, but you're I, paying for the hotels. <laughs> I'll tell you what, uh, you know, I always come back to this. Uh, you've heard me say it already on this uh, broadcast. Uh, what would I do if you were my sister or my aunt or mom? I'll tell you what I'd do. I'd get in the car and go to Dr. Hodgkiss because this way you know and you're not you're not taking any chances. If you were my relative, I would come pick you up, bring you to Dr. Hodgkiss. That's what I would do. I, because I don't know you, so I would have to dispatch you. I don't know if you're going to have trouble parking at Michigan, if they're going to give you the right appointment. And, and so, but I have a, a, a an assurance here that if you can find your way to Dr. Hodgkiss, you are going to do better. I think you should do that. I don't want to overstep my bounds here, Kim, but <laughs> that's what I think Marie should do. Well, well, it may be easier for him to go in the car for a few hours and drive. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but he, sure can't, he can't bring so. his machine. That's the yeah. problem. <laughs> his machine is not mobile. And where is that? That's in Tennessee. So so the right 
at the border between Kentucky and Tennessee. We have a we have, actually have a big office up there in a, a city called Union City, small town in the middle of nowhere. Well, yeah. I had never left Michigan until I met Kim, and I went over to Indiana. So yeah. <laughs> maybe I no, can that... talk to a couple of my boys, see if I can figure something out. Yeah, I'm if you if, sure if you get the transportation, I'll pay for the oh, hotel. Oh, wait. Yeah, no, <laughs> I just thought of that, Kim. Being outside of Michigan, I don't think my insurance will cover it because that 